Okay. Well, Greg, we will go ahead and get started. I'll give you a quick introduction and then you can uh, share your screen or say whatever you want to say. Everybody, thank you for joining us today uh, for our Healthy at Home webinar. Today's presentation is Healthy Living for Your Brain and Body. And our presenter is Greg Romero. And Greg has been a volunteer for the Utah chapter of the Alzheimer's Association for the past six years. He served on the chapter's board and currently helps as a community educator. Greg is the marketing director, community li liaison for Auburn Crest Home Health and Hospice. In this role and similar prior healthcare roles, he has seen the value of dementia education and the comfort and understanding it provides to families and their loved ones. Greg lives and works in Salt Lake City. He is married to his college sweetheart and together they have five children and seven grandchildren. That's excellent. I'm super excited for the presentation, Greg, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks, Paige. Um, I'll uh, bring my screen up with the presentation in a minute. Uh, I always like to uh, start out, uh, especially if we have a smaller group and it looks like, at least for my screen, Besides uh, our representatives from um, uh, Salt Lake County, uh, we also have uh, Darlene. Darlene, are you out there? Great, okay. Uh, Kay. Uh, Carol Butler. Then uh, we have initials LF. And then uh, Sadie May. Uh, and that's all I can see at the moment. There may be others that are uh, joining us. Uh, Whoever is joining us, welcome. Um, thank you for the introduction, Paige. Uh, I I enjoy the opportunity to, to uh, uh, do a little education around uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. That's typically the topics that we discuss with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, in conjunction with that, uh, you know, one of our big priorities is to help people early on uh, with ideas, tips, strategies for the topic of this uh, presentation, health, healthy living for your brain and body. So our focus will be mainly on things that you perhaps have heard before, uh, areas of health, uh, social development, uh, you know, uh, diet, those things that uh, again, may be reminders uh, but I think will be valuable. We all need reminders from time to time. Um, and then we'll also have a bit of a discussion around Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, that really is our um, our mission is to um, rid the world of dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, the org organization, the Alzheimer's Association, is actively uh, funding research. And there are chapters in, I think, every state uh, and uh, organization support groups that that work with those those chapters. So a lot of people are involved in helping, in, you know, support people who either have family members that are uh, suffering from Alzheimer's dementia or uh, who themselves are in the early stages. So um, this will be a rather casual session. I'd encourage you if you have questions. Uh, if you if you'd like to, you can uh, you know raise your hand on the screen or um, uh, throw something into the, into the chat window, and uh, we'll take it uh, as a topic to discuss once the presentation has ended. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, you know what we'll talk about today. Um, I do like to always ask at the beginning of these presentations for those that are uh, attending. If there's anything specific, any specific reason that you wanted to attend, any questions that uh, you may have that you, you you really would like to have answered or uh, have us focus on in the presentation. So um, if you do, uh, you can unmute yourself uh, or throw a, a, um, a question in the chat uh, chat box. Okay. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll bring up the presentation. Give me a minute to uh, bring it full screen. Um, hopefully all of you can can see my screen. Can all of you see my screen? It looks good. 
Okay. Okay. So here we go. All right. So again, today's topic is healthy living for your brain and body. Uh, tips from the latest research. Okay. Okay. So here's our focal points for today. Um, one of the things we want to do is identify reasons for taking care of your, yourself as you age. Now, obviously, all of us want to do that, but um, there are specific things uh, that we'll talk about that may give you additional reasons for wanting to take care of yourself as you get older. And I think all of us, as we, as we age, are curious, you know, what's coming? Um, how, how do we best prepare? Um, so, we're going to talk about 4 specific areas. Uh, 1 is physical health and exercise. Next is diet and nutrition. Uh, then cognitive activity. You know, are we learning? Are we uh, developing? Uh, uh, challenging our brain from day to day and social engagement and social engagement is vital as we get older. Uh, you probably know that uh, uh, especially. You know, during the, uh, the pandemic, there was uh, kind of an ep epidemic of people isolating themselves, especially as they got older. Isolation leads to depression to a lot of other things. So, um, anyway, the strategies will help in, in many of these areas. Um, and then also, uh, if you're interested, there is a workbook that goes along with this that is available. I can um, mail it to Paige or to Erica. Uh, and uh, they can send it out for who, to whoever, whoever would like to uh, use it. Um, it uh, again, this is the front page of it, and it has sections uh, that uh, actually go into some detail around the four areas that we talked about. Um, you know, for example, on the physical health and exercise uh, category, it talks about some things that you should do, things that you should avoid. Uh, and gives you kind of a workbook where you can go in and, and write down, well, here are the things I enjoy doing that uh, I want to start right away. Um, here's a one month goal, a six month goal. Um, and, you know, and you can then add some text around what your plan might entail in each of these areas. So it's available. Um, again, if you, you'd like one, just to uh, mention in the chat box that you, you know, you'd like one email to you, we can do that. Okay, um, aging and health. Um, so let's let's talk about some of the factors that contribute to how we age. Um, first of all, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, are pretty much out of our control. Things like our genes, um, um, you know, things that uh, just happen as we get older. You know, we get uh, gray hair, we start to get wrinkles. Uh, our brain doesn't work as quickly and as nimbly as it used to. Um, we're not able to move as efficiently as we'd like. Uh, that happens, you know, pretty much with everyone as we get older. Uh, it may be different to some degree on how well people take care of themselves, but um, many of those things um, that happen are outside of, of our control. Um, but there are areas that are within our control. Uh, some things that we do have a, you know, a degree of control over, and those involve our lifestyles, and um, environmental factors uh, around us. So, um, and, and it's interesting to note that even uh, some families that uh, have genetic predispositions toward particular conditions, some of these lifestyle and environmental changes uh, could or uh, change the uh, the course of those conditions significantly. So, all right. So let's talk about. Um, our brains. Uh, obviously, that's the control center of our body. Um, it's the area of thought, memory. Uh, it's vital, and we want to do everything we can to keep it healthy and functioning as it should. Um, so, here's a little bit of information about our brains. There are 100 billion nerve cells or neurons that create a, a branching network within our brain. Um, they're like the uh, branches of a tree. And um, they function through uh, electro um, signals uh, that that uh, actually uh, help us form memories and thoughts. Um, 
Now, because we're with, I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, I want to talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, just at a very high level, Alzheimer's disease destroys brain cells. And it does that uh, uh, through the buildup of plaques and tangles. Uh, and we can provide more information on that uh, uh, later if you like. But uh, basically, it changes the brain and it destroys nerve centers. Um, there is no cure for Alzheimer's, um, but we believe that they're, you know, with good health and um, for your brain and your body, that uh, it could have some effect on, you know, your your um, timeline if you are going to get. Uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, we know through much research that the heart and brain are interrelated. Um, you know, our brains depend on a rich supply of blood and nutrients to keep them operating properly. And when something happens in our bodies that prevents that normal flow of that blood and nutrients and oxygen, um, that begins to cause problems. So, uh, we need to do all that we can to uh, keep our bodies in the best shape so that that oxygen and those uh, vitamins, minerals, everything we need uh, are there. And, and it's interesting to note that 25% of blood from every heartbeat goes you know, directly to the brain. So, that's a, that was one of the facts that really surprised me as I started to do these presentations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, just to set kind of level set, um, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. So, at a very high level, uh, if you we, use, we we always call it the umbrella of dementia. Underneath dementia, there are several types of diseases. Uh, Alzheimer's is the most common. Alzheimer's uh, is uh, when someone has dementia. Usually, uh, 60 to 80 percent of the people who have dementia have Alzheimer's. So, it's the largest cause of, uh, of dementia. But there are other things that uh, other types like uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia, um, um, other types of dementia. And uh, these are, as it says on the slide, they're not a normal part of aging. Uh, some people will think, well, I'm just getting older. Um, I'm going to forget things. I'm going to have some of these issues. Yes, you, you will. Again, there are normal areas of aging, but certain parts of aging uh, when you have dementia uh, are radically um, uh, accelerated and uh, because of the way the, de de the disease is affecting your brain. Um, memory. Uh, is probably the, the foremost one, short-term memory especially. Uh, so, we won't go into a lot of detail, but just know that these are not a normal part of aging. Um, I mentioned that Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, and uh, there are several known risk factors for Alzheimer's. The key, the major one being age. Um, one of the interesting st statistics is uh, as people age, um, uh, they are more likely to have dementia. Um, I think the statistic, and you know, maybe Julie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for those over 85 years old, one in three that you see on the street will have some form of dementia. So that's a huge, you know, amount of, you know, of our population when you really think about it, our senior population. Um, again, just. To say therapies for Alzheimer's can treat symptoms, but they cannot cure uh, or prevent it, uh, or even slow, you know, the disease. It's a progressive disease. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, four areas. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, that these are available in the workbook. Um, we'll go into some detail on each of these. There'll be some uh, kind of uh, guest speakers. I like to call them. Uh, that will come up on the video, so hopefully you'll be able to uh, see and hear, you know, the dialogue behind those. Okay, so the first one we'll address is physical health and exercise. 
So what do we know about uh, physical health and exercise? Well, obviously there is um, uh, a mountain full of, of research um, studies that uh, talk about how physical exercise can help. Um, we do know through those studies that cardiovascular activity may reduce your risk of cognitive decline. And, and to some extent that makes sense because as we talked about the brain and its need for blood flow and all the things that come with that blood flow, uh, regular exercise leads to increased blood flow. Uh, and it also you know, yields other physical uh, benefits or other benefits up there too. Um, just know that there's no single recipe uh, in terms of, you know, uh, designing, uh, you know, a, a specific plan. Uh, everyone's a little different. Um, and again, that's where the workbook comes in, I think, handy here in helping you develop your own plan. Okay, so we're going to listen to uh, a gentleman by the name of Woodley, and he's going to discuss uh, his habit of developing, how he went about developing the habit of of exercise. It's surprising how you can easily build up habits of just taking 15 to 20 minutes out of your day to go down, hit the treadmill, and just do it. Just do it. Just get on it, put my headphones on, and just walk at a nice brisk pace for myself, build up a quick heartbeat, quick sweat, and it's amazing how quickly I can go from 15 minutes to 20 minutes and then over time, 30 minutes and over time, 40 minutes before you know it, you know, you're up to 45 minutes of walking and even at a higher incline and also at a higher pace. And again, it's all about incorporating habits and the choices that we make. Okay. So I think that, uh, you know, a lot of us have had this experience where, um, we recognize kind of a void in our physical health and we start a, a habit, hopefully of walking or doing some other type of exercise. And if we stick to it, we can really see some of those benefits. Um, so, all right, let's go to the next part of the slide. Um, so what can we do or what can you do? Well, I think one of the keys is to start with something you like. Um, I have a friend uh, that, uh, enjoys exercise, but he hates running. And one of his good friends is a runner and is constantly trying to get him to uh, join him on, you know, his, his uh, weekly runs. It's just something he doesn't like to do and he's not probably going to do it. <laughs> um, so do something you like. If you don't like running, walk, uh, go to a gym, walk on a treadmill, um, get involved in, in uh, some type of aerobic exercise. Um, uh, study yoga, you know, or go to a, a local pool and join in some of their uh, um, aquatic act, you know, um, uh, exercises. So do something you like, um, start out small. Uh, Woodley mentioned, you know, start out gradually. Uh, that's the best, best path to have some success. Um, move safely. This is important. Uh, you know, if you're going to do yoga as the ladies here on the, the screen show, have a mat. <laughs> If you're going to ride your bike, wear a helmet. Um, if you're going to skate or, or otherwise, get some knee pads. Um, so do it safely. And then also get your heart rate up. Uh, we want to uh, challenge our heart. And it's important that whatever you do, that you get your heart rate up above its normal, you know, its normal rate. Uh, here's a key. Ask your friends to join you. Um, this is some... Uh, uh, I see this in our in our family. Uh, my mother-in-law, uh, she's 80 years old, and uh, she has three friends that she walks with every morning, and they walk for you know a mile and a half, two miles, and they do it rain or shine, and uh, they have become very close over the years. I mean, they do other things, but uh, that's one of the things that they enjoy, and all, uh, together they they keep each other accountable. Um, and I, I feel strongly that it's contributed to, to their health. And the last suggestion here is, you know, check with your doctor before you start. If you've had a long period of inactivity or you've had some health conditions that you're just coming out of or coping with, um, it's always good to check with your doctor uh, before you start. It's also good to know what medications you're on that may affect you when you start your, um, you know, your activity. 
Okay, next. Uh, most of these things you'll readily recognize and agree with. Uh, you know, what can we do um, in addition? And one is if you're smoking, stop smoking. Okay, that's that's an obvious thing. Um, my, uh, my mother passed uh, from lung cancer. She smoked for many years and uh, uh, she did stop uh, in her 40s uh, and she didn't pass until she was 73, but she always felt that it had some uh, effect on her getting uh, lung cancer. Uh, avoid excess alcohol, uh, not only for, you know, the obvious reasons of uh, being a dangerous driver or, you know, it affecting you in your daily tasks, um, but uh, it also has other effects. Uh, it affects your sleep. It uh, affects, um, you know, your liver. It, it has a lot of effects. So avoid excess alcohol. Get adequate sleep. Now, this is important for us. Um, uh, I uh, actually uh, wear a CPAP at night. Um, I had, when I was younger, uh, difficulty sleeping and uh, went to my doctor. He said, hey, you need a, a sleep study. Went through that and it's made such a huge difference in my life. And it's not just something that older people, you know, seniors need to discuss. There are a lot of younger people who, based on a sleep study, find, you know, benefit. So, uh, but there are other ways to get adequate sleep you know, going to sleep at a certain time every day to get used to that routine. Um, so yeah, make that a priority. Avoid head injury. Uh, the picture here shows someone riding a bike. Uh, you wanna avoid, uh, you know, any chance of having a head injury. Um, manage stress, lots of ways to manage stress. Exercise is a great way. Meditation is another way. You'll find a lot of uh, app, apps on a phone that uh, you can uh, install that will work, you know, guide you through meditation. It'll guide you through breathing exercises. Um, but uh, I think the best way is to get some form of physical exercise. Uh, treat depression. You know, it's one thing to realize that you're depressed. It's another thing to go to the doctor and, uh, you know, have the doctor uh, based on, you know, a survey or whatever information they ask of you uh, to realize maybe I do have something more serious with depression and maybe I, uh, you know, medication would help or some form of treatment. And then uh, visit your doctor regularly. Uh, and that includes not just your doctor, but that includes your eye doctor. As we get older, maybe we want to check our hearing. Uh, you know, be active in, in uh, getting those things uh, taken care of when you can. Okay, um, here's one thing that goes along with that. Uh, there are lots of tools, uh, equipment um, that can help us monitor our health. And uh, I think the biggest one, as you see here on the screen, is blood pressure. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a blood pressure cuff, but we encourage you to get one. Uh, to check your blood pressure from time to time, check it under different circumstances, and then track your blood pressure. Uh, one of the things that we uh, encourage is if you have a, an appointment with your doctor, maybe it's been a year or two since you've been in for a physical, um, maybe the week before, you know, test your blood pressure in the morning and evening um, and write those numbers down, have them ready for your doctor when you go in. Uh, blood sugar, uh, you know, some people, uh, they may not realize it, but they may be pre-diabetic uh, or diabetic. And uh, so uh, it's not bad. And I think a lot of doctors in a normal exercise, especially as we get older, will include a blood sugar uh, check, uh, an A1C check. Uh, monitor your weight, uh, know the, the signs uh, in terms of uh, when you need to pay more attention to the diet. And then the cholesterol, of course, that's uh, one of the things we all wanna uh, keep track of. Okay. So that, that pretty much ends our, our little discussion on uh, physical health and exercise. Let's move on to diet and nutrition. Um, so again, let's go back to this, you know, what's good for the heart may, it may also be good for the brain. And, um, a lot of the foods we eat have an effect on the heart, nourish the heart. Um, it's also nourishing the brain at, at the same time. Um, I think all of us have been on some types of diet in the past, whether it's to lose weight or, you know, sometimes it's focused on a physical ailment that we have. But in general, we all should have a good diet uh, that, uh, you know, 
helps us reduce fat uh, as it makes us aware of, you know, our cholesterol and focuses on that. Um, and um, the benefits are long term in terms of our health uh, in avoiding things that, um, you know, could possibly change our life later down the road. Okay. So we have uh, another guest speaker. This is Martha. She's the director of uh, nutrition at uh, Rush University. So we'll go ahead and have her take the floor. Foods that have been shown to um, lead to healthy aging would be uh, fruits and vegetables, and in particular, green leafy vegetables and berries, as well as limited intake of high fat food items that you get through high fat dairy and cheese and red meats, and also um, healthy vegetable oils. So this would be olive oil would be a good example, have been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease as well as dementia. Okay. Foods that have been. Sorry, I'm just trying to move this to the next slide. Here. There we go. All right. So in general, here are some things that uh, we want to focus on eating and avoiding. Uh, she mentioned vegetables. Uh, this is one of the hardest things for me to get into my daily routine. Uh, uh, even as a kid, I wasn't very, very interested in vegetables, uh, but they play a key role in providing some nutrients uh, that we that we need, our bodies need. So introducing more vegetables, more fruit into our, you know, our diet uh, is important, and, and and that can be easy sometimes. It's maybe just as easy as getting a, an apple, cutting it up, uh, and taking it with you, you know, on the go during the day. Um, nuts, beans, and whole grains. Uh, maybe focusing our diet more on you know less pre-processed foods, and more natural whole grains. Um, lean meats, uh, fish, and poultry. Maybe avoiding some of those that are higher in fat and, and cholesterol. And then vegetable oils play a, you know oils play an important part in our our diet and, and in our health. Uh, there are good oils and oils that are not so good. Um, so that's something that uh, you know you want to you want to focus on. And as we go over to the avoid, you know avoid some of those oils that are high in saturated or trans fats. Um, also avoid processed foods. I mentioned that uh, have less sugar, less salt. You know, as we get older, lots of doctors encourage us to cut down on our our salt because of blood pressure issues. And I think in general, it's just a good, um, you know, a good recommendation. Uh, avoid deep fried foods, you know, and unhealthy fast foods. And you know, at today's life and the pace of of today's life, it's so easy to get in the habit of stopping at the same fast food restaurant as you're going home or going to work in the morning. Um, maybe we can rethink some of that to include healthier options. Um, you know, here are some things that we can do. Uh, it's important that we look at reputable sources about things that we add to our, uh, our diets, uh, as well as some of those uh, ancillary things that we are encouraged uh, to add, uh, dietary supplements, vitamins, um, you know, the uh, um, FDA is very careful about, uh, you know, what companies can do when they, they label their products and uh, labeling them as a cure for something generally will get them in trouble with the FDA unless there's clinical proof behind it. Uh, so as you listen to uh, things on the internet or late night ads on TV that promise certain things, you know, take them with a, a grain of salt and maybe do some research on your own through Google or, or otherwise about uh, how some of those products have affected other people. And that includes vitamins. You know, um, my mother was a, a vitamin guru and uh, there were times when uh, she went to her doctor and told her how much uh, vitamin D or E she was taking. And the doctor had some, some things to correct for her to correct because she was overdosing on, on some of those. Uh, overall, general guidance, work with your doctor on, uh, on anything, vitamins, drugs, whatever um, you're taking. Okay, so let's move to uh, cognitive activity. 
Um, here's what we know. We know that keeping our, main, our mind active is essential in forming new connections among brain cells. And we wanna be doing that our whole life. We wanna be encouraging those connections, uh, retaining the connections that are made. Um, cognitive activity in its own way encourages blood, for, blood flow to the brain. It's not only physical activity that does that, but cognitive activity can also do that. Um, so uh, the studies have shown that mentally stimulating activities uh, can uh, maintain or even improve cognition to some degree. Um, you know, whether that's uh, us learning a new language, uh, taking a, a college course, um, you know, reading a book or even watching TV, our, our brain, when we watch uh, uh, something that's uh, interesting to us, uh, does a lot of thinking and processing. And even that can be a, a, a you know, a, 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 um, a, a way to encourage cognitive activity. Okay. So here's the uh, director of the Alzheimer's Disease Center in Chicago at Rush, uh, at Rush uh, the Alzheimer's Center there. His name's David Bennett. Let's turn some time over to him. One of the most interesting factors is cognitive stimulating activities, which basically for us just means uh, mental processing of information. Um, it can be from a book, it can be from the radio, it can be a magazine, it can be from a lecture, it can actually be from watching TV. All of these things require processing information. And the old adage of, you know, use it or lose it is actually something that turns out, at least from the observational data, to look like it's true. So numerous studies now have shown that being more engaged um, in cognitively stimulating activities is actually good for maintaining cognition. And it's true in late life, and it's true in early life. And so what we recommend is that you start early, and if you're already late, start now. I love that that last part of, uh, you know, if, if you haven't been doing something, start now. Uh, all of us can do something to uh, increase the mental and cognitive activity that we have from day to day. Okay, so here are some suggestions. I mentioned some earlier, but uh, reading books or interesting articles uh, can be vital. Um, I know right now I'm, I'm uh, going back and uh, I love photography. It's been uh, five or six years since I've actually done some. So I've ordered some books and some other things that will help me get back into it. And it really is challenging. It really does make me think. And um, it, it also makes me feel you know, more alive. Um, more like um, life is is uh, you know worthwhile and interesting. So that cognitive activity, a lack of cognitive activity, of course, can lead to depression and other things. Um, completing puzzles and playing games that are challenging for you, and and uh, you might you know just putting together a you know a hundred piece puzzle or more uh, can certainly help. Uh, doing things more challenging that require more cognitive. Um, focus, uh, things like chess or other board games can be important and they can be very enjoyable with family and friends. Uh, learning new skills or hobbies. Uh, there's a gentleman that I know in our neighborhood. Uh, it's retired. He just bought a whole bunch of new uh, woodworking equipment and uh, he is, I have to say, he's like a new man. He's making things for the grandchildren. He's doing lots of things and uh, he just seems like, you know, he's he's happy and uh, very cognitively there. Okay, um, and then ongoing learning. Uh, you know, I mentioned going to college, you know, or to a community education in person, but today there are lots of online uh, courses that you can take. Uh, in fact, we have online courses on Alzheimer's and dementia that require, that, that don't require a teacher. You can just sign on and take them, um, but uh, they're available in almost every category, um, things like TED Talks can be very engaging and interesting. Um, and then uh, just going to YouTube and searching, you know, maybe a hobby that you have or something that you're interested in, you know, plant care or, or uh, gardening can bring up a whole wealth of interesting things to engage you mentally. Okay. And the last one we'll talk about is social engagement. And um, 
this one I, I, I have a real um, passion around. Uh, in my job in home health and, and hospice, we work with a lot of seniors and uh, especially over the past two years where, you know, COVID had a huge impact on people being able to get out, to uh, socialize, uh, to engage with others. Uh, there were, uh, you know, a lot of cases of isolation, depression, uh, lack of mobility and health. Um, so social engagement can help with all of those things. Uh, and it is associated in studies with living longer with fewer disabilities. Okay, uh, staying engaged in the community offers you an opportunity to maintain your skills. So whether it's volunteering, you know, at your local uh, food bank or senior center, uh, or getting involved with uh, youth in the community, uh, it's a wonderful way to provide um, help in the community to be active and involved. Um, so, and just again, as a reminder uh, to reemphasize, you know, remaining both socially and mentally active may support brain health and possibly delay the onset of dementia. Okay. So here are some suggestions on what we can do. Uh, visit with friends and family, and 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 that can be something that you can schedule on a regular basis. I know with our grandkids, uh, we have a regularly scheduled grandma and grandpa night where they come over once a month, and let me tell you that can be very very. Uh, <laughs> engaging and challenging cognitively as well as physically. Um, but we look forward to it and uh, it does keep us involved with our um, sons and daughters and our, our sons and daughter-in-laws. Um, and we, we have that on a consistent basis. So whether it's your family or whether it's inviting someone over for dinner, uh, be more active in doing that. Uh, just engaging with others, whether you know it's in, let's say you're shopping, engaging with people that you meet that are buying the same thing you're buying or in line with you, uh, just, you know, talking to others. Um, staying involved in the community, we talked about volunteering in the community. There's lots of opportunities. Um, um, volunteer outside the home, uh, same thing. And then join a group or a club. Um, my mother-in-law is involved with the book club that she loves. They must have been doing it for like 10 or 15 years. And uh, it's one of the things she looks forward to every month. So. Lots of things we can do to, to increase our social engagement. So, um, putting all of these things together uh, is important to achieving the maximum benefits. And um, again, I, I think Julia and I have a, a, a special frame of reference here is that we tend to, in our jobs, see uh, people as they age, you know, age 65 or older. And obviously, if you're attending this this presentation, you're attending because, um, you know, you may, you want to know how to have a healthier brain and body. You may be uh, younger than you know, uh, you know, 65 or less. Um, but uh, the earlier you start, the better chances you're going to have to have those benefits, those maximum benefits. And again, all four of these play a critical role. Okay, here is uh, Bill Fees. Uh, he's a scientist uh, at the uh, medical center uh, that does, uh, excuse me, the medical and scientific relations department of the Alzheimer's Association National Office. Recently at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, there was a study reported of the results of a large clinical trial that was done in the Scandinavian countries. And in this trial, they took half the people in the trial and they adjusted their exercise level, their diet, uh, their social engagement, uh, and their mental stimulation. They, they developed programs for each one of those variables, uh, changed all of those for the people that were in the test group, and the control group just lived as they had been. There is a tremendous benefit to doing studies where we make changes and observe after the fact, that's a much stronger study than just observing people and trying to make judgments um, after life has changed for them. To my mind, one of the things that this has done is it, it's changed the, the force of uh, recommendation that we might make around uh, the benefit of these interventions for prevention of Alzheimer's disease or for brain health and the fact is that I think it's moved it from possibly 
exercise, diet adjustments, social engagement, mental stimulation are useful to probably. And that's a big change and makes it easier for people to make those kinds of adjustments um, for the benefit of their future health. Okay, let me um, get back to where I was. Sorry. Right. So, um, how can we take this information and what can we do with it? Well, we can start now. Uh, again, uh, hopefully, you've formed some ideas based on what we've discussed. This workbook is out here uh, available that we can email you. Um, Begin today, whether it's just looking at the one thing that came to your mind during the presentation, you know, maybe it's including more vegetables in your diet. Maybe it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, going out with uh, your friend who walks every day and has invited you to attend. Um, but begin today, smart, uh, start small and build. Um, I think you, uh, the first video that we showed, uh, showed a gentleman that, uh, you know, start out with five minutes, 15 minutes, and you could see the, the, uh, the uh, excitement he had in, the, in his developing of that new habit. Um, it's key that you do what you enjoy. So whatever you're doing, make sure it's something that fits with, um, you know, what uh, uh, you'll stick to, you know, what you, what you really enjoy. Uh, and again, talking about those four areas, there's lots of things, whether it's learning, whether it's uh, certain, you know, things in our diet, uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, you know, you have lots of variables that you can work with. Um, make healthy choices. Uh, we need to do that daily in all aspects of our life. Uh, make a plan. You know, this is uh, one of the reasons we we have this workbook is uh, it, it 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 makes it easy and it's it's easier to commit to when you write something down, and and even more. Uh, uh, beneficial if you show it to someone else and explain to them your desire to, you know, reach certain goals and you have kind of an accountability partner uh, that will help you. And that's shown to be key in helping people with these types of changes. Um, getting others involved, you know, like an accountability partner, uh, getting your spouse involved, you know, if you're changing your diet, maybe you can encourage your, your spouse to, uh, uh, to join you with some of those changes. And then have fun, you know, uh, that's really what uh, we want in our life is enjoyment, fun, uh, as well as progress. And uh, um, these types of changes can bring those things, you know, with them. Okay, and then uh, be a savvy consumer. I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're promised certain things, whether on TV, on the web, uh, on Facebook, if it's too good to be true, it probably, uh, you know, is uh, is not uh, a viable solution. Okay, um, you know, be careful of those huge promises or miracle cures. Do research. I mean, being a, a, a Google doctor, as they say, you know, uh, some doctors don't like it when you do that. But I always think it's important that we do our own research. Uh, we can bring good information to our doctors and get their opinion. But uh, we know our bo bodies better than, you know, doctors do. And there may be certain things that we can Google and find out that can help us uh, even before we uh, go to a doctor. Uh, we might not need to. But maybe we can find what we need uh, through good research. And then uh, make sure you have some trusted, reputable pr professionals. Um, I'll just mention here that as we work with seniors, it's interesting how many of them um, and I think it's probably a fairly large percentage. I'd say, you know, maybe 15 to 25% of them have not uh, visited their doctor within the past year, or even worse, don't have a primary care physician. Uh, so when, you know, they need help, they don't know who to go to. So, uh, you know, make sure you hold on to those doctors that you have. If your doctor's retiring, Get a new doctor and, you know, find one, get recommendations, find one that you can trust. Um, local pharmacists is key to uh, helping you sort out your drugs and the effects that they have on you. And then associations like the Alzheimer's Association or the Heart Association, you know, they have websites with great information. Um, you know, take advantage of that. Okay. 
Uh, if your interest is again around Alzheimer's and dementia, we have lots of courses available. I was mentioning to Paige earlier that we have a, a 10 warning signs of dementia uh, that answers some questions about what's normal as you age and what may be an indication that uh, you know you may be in the early stages of, of dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, our website, alz.org, provides great information. Uh, there's lots of fun tools, fun education that, again, you can start and do on your own without any involvement from anybody else. Um, also, on the topic of dementia and Alzheimer's, if you have questions, maybe it's about someone that you love that uh, uh, you think may have Alzheimer's or has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, you can call this 1-800 number that's on the screen. Uh, they have someone there 24-7, uh, available all day, every day, including holidays. Uh, these are people that are um, been educated uh, in Alzheimer's and dementia, and uh, they've had a lot of experience working with people actually around the world uh, with um, those diseases. Um, so, uh, again, contact us if we can help or a resource. Get involved. Uh, we have two large events that we have every year: the the Walk to End Alzheimer's here in Utah. There are several that take place throughout uh, the Wasatch Front, and uh, you know I, I think it, they even have one in St. George um, and in Logan. Um, so uh, you can get involved with the walk, a great exercise. <laughs> and then um, uh, we have uh, something called the Longest Day, where we raise funds on the longest day of the year in June. Um, and we have lots of uh, participating partners that do that, and you can get involved in, you know, in, in uh, working with some of those partners or helping sponsor those events. Um, you can be an advocate for Alzheimer's uh, legislation. You can volunteer, kind of do, you know, what I'm doing, or you know, help with other needs that they have. So uh, get involved. All right, um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, Maybe we can open the floor. I'll stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Stop sharing. And uh, maybe make it uh, available uh, for any questions that folks have out there. So, are there any questions? Or Paige, anything you've seen in the, the chat window that we should discuss? I only saw one thing in the chat. And that was what I wrote. Okay. Okay. Um, were there any that were in attendance here that were hoping to learn more about Alzheimer's and dementia? You can raise your hand or unmute your your microphone. Again, if there are questions you have. Um, you know, there's there's lots of resources available. I just did a, a presentation at um, the uh, up in Ogden uh, for a, um, a county health uh, department. They had probably 30 people in person there, and it was just the basics about Alzheimer's and dementia. We had lots of questions, a lot of interested parties, and there were probably five or six that that were there that were actually caregivers for people who had um, some form of dementia. Okay, um, I have a question is, is it yes. hereditary? Um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Genes can affect. Um, getting Alzheimer's, I mean, there's 2 different risk factors there. Um, there, well, to gene types, let's say gene types. Um, 1 of the ones that. Uh, we don't see very often to be honest, but. Uh, uh, that determine that you may uh, have a strong um, chance of getting uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, or something called um, deterministic genes. And so, for those that have have Alzheimer's that we've studied, uh, you know, only like ten percent of those had genes that show um, that uh, you know you probably will. You do have a gene that you probably will get Alzheimer's. Uh, just normal hereditary, uh, you know, if you've had uh, relatives, uh, um, mother, father, grandfather, grandmother that have had dementia, there is a higher risk that you could get dementia, but it doesn't mean that you will get dementia. 
Did that help? Did that answer the question? Yes, it did. Okay, great. Anything else that uh, anyone has? A question, Greg. So yes. Grandpa, he had Alzheimer's, but he also was a boxer. Uh -huh. I'm wondering, like, could I, does lifestyle contribute to Alzheimer's? Because I'm like, yeah. I probably do have the genetic factor, but also his lifestyle probably made those genes. It's so hard to determine. I mean, you may have a boxer that, you know, had some brain injuries that uh, was that weren't diagnosed that never seemed at the time to, you know, have an effect that could have affected some portion of, the, you know, or some center of the brain that may only show up later in life. Uh, that in combination with beginning dementia may, uh, you know, make it even, um, you know, more uh, present there, uh, you know, uh, their dementia. So, yes, lifestyle factors do have uh, an effect on, you know, dementia when it does rear its head. Yes. Um, any other uh, questions or comments? One more question. If you have Parkinson's, does you have increased chance of getting Alzheimer's or dementia? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure, Julia, do you know? Have you heard anything on that? Um, I don't think... As far as I know, it's not a. It doesn't increase the risk of of Alzheimer's disease because there is there there is already a, there's a dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, um, right. but it's not it. But it it is one of those things where if you do have dementia Parkinson's dementia, then you're you're good and you're you don't have to worry about Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, um, there's a type they call it mixed dementia, and that's generally. Uh, another type of de dementia in addition to Alzheimer's disease. Most commonly it's Alzheimer's disease and va vascular dementia, um, but it's, it's, it's not common for someone to develop Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's dementia. It's, you know, generally we see one of those things happening more frequently. So if you have Parkinson's, you'll, you're more likely to see the dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, but it's not a off the table that it's not a possibility, but it's not as frequent that if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other questions that you have? Okay, well, we are um, we scheduled for an hour. I mentioned it's usually a 40 minute presentation with some time for uh, for questions. We appreciate you participating. Um, hopefully, again, it's given you some ideas on areas you can focus on to better your health, uh, both brain and body. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are additional, if there is additional interest in other topics around Alzheimer's or dementia, um, any of the volunteers, uh, whoever Erica worked with, uh, which was probably Raven, can put those things in place for another presentation. All right. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, to present. Thank you very much, Greg. I really appreciate it. Um, you're, you're very welcome. That was a wonderful presentation. I do encourage everyone. I can't hear you, Paige. Sorry. Sorry, Anne. Anne, I have to take this one to the bank. Okay. Now, Eric. A little bit. I can I can hear you a little bit. Maybe if you get closer to the the mic there. I don't know. Uh, that sounds better. Let's try this. Can y'all hear me with this yes. better? Okay. Yes. I was just saying, Greg. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, and I do encourage anybody who's who wants more information. I was telling Greg before we started. My father passed about ten years ago from a type of dementia and at the time we knew nothing about it we didn't have the resources and if i had had the alzheimer's association uh, if i had known um and i think it would have helped a lot uh it wouldn't have taken away my dad's disease but it sure would have helped us know more about it and uh, that support eases sometimes that confusion and pain and so please please uh, if you want to get in touch with me with topics that you're interested in, we are happy to facilitate that. And uh, Greg, again, thank you so much for being here. That was wonderful. Very and 
everything Greg said, you can accomplish at the senior centers here at Salt Lake County, right? Yes. Exercise, social, uh, cognitive stimulation. I mean, we are the place, uh, whether it's online or in person. So I uh, encourage you all to take advantage of that as well. So again, Greg, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, please join us next Tuesday at two o'clock. We're gonna be doing growing a summer garden in the Salt Lake Valley, which is hard to believe right now, given all the <laughs> snow that's outside. Let's just think of it as moisture. Learn how to grow your own summer veggies, navigating the Salt Lake Valley's growing season. This webinar will cover planting dates, crop rep recommendations, companion planting, pest management, beneficial insects, where, where to start your seeds uh, and more. So please join us um, and everybody have a wonderful day. Be safe out there, stay warm, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Right. Thanks. Thank you.